picture since we lost the last game. But other than that, we're not complaining. It was a tough one and uh, nothing at all to be worried about. There's new structure uh, on the team this year, and uh, a lot of the girls are back. And I understand that uh, general manager Alex Saunders is down here somewhere on the VIP phone. We have Alex right in front of us with Greg Marshall and Jamie Strahl from the bootleggers also. Go, these are the bootleggers over here, Becky. You've been waiting to meet them. There they are. There's two of them that have nothing to do over there. I mean, there's Jamie Straw. He's a wide receiver and star player with the bootleggers. There's Greg Marshall, former CFL player with the Ottawa Rough Riders, the Shenley Award winner, now head coach of the Ottawa Rough Bootleggers, and Alex Saunders, general manager to the Ottawa Bootleggers football team. And there's two guys there who have nothing to do right now, so start dialing those phones. They had the first official bootlegger bash of the season uh, not long ago, and I want to thank you guys for sending over that little special thing. I can't talk about it except it's a uh, power breakfast. It's a cold Sunday in November, the first snowfall of the year. The Grey Cup is a week away, and most football teams in Canada have put away their equipment until June. But what is going on at Lansdowne Park this afternoon is a different brand of Canadian football. The Ottawa Bootleggers, Canada's only semi-pro football team, is the brainchild of two local ex-university players who never found a place for themselves in the Canadian Football League. Heading into the first game of the playoffs against the Marlboro, Massachusetts Shamrocks, the bootleggers have made news across North America by being the only undefeated semi-pro football team on the continent. They are ranked number one in just their second year of existence. For this group of athletes, there is no money to be made by winning, and for most, there is no possibility of a future in professional football. Just the glory from the cheering of the dedicated fans who come out to Lansdowne to see the city's winningest football team. As Canadians, the bootleggers have always been looked upon as underdogs, playing four-down football and facing all-American opponents. Mike White, the ex-Laurier University player and ex-Waterloo coach who co-founded the bootleggers, scoffs at those who doubted he could put together a competitive team of Canadians. You know, you, I, I knew I could feel the team from the guys here. I mean, from the area, I grew up here, coached a lot of the guys, and it just take, took a couple phone calls. Or the average Canadian thinks any time you come up against the Americans, you're going to lose because they're just so powerful and they're that much smarter and that much organized. It's a load of crap. It's just they package things better, they sell themselves better, and they hype themselves better. Um, Entertainment-wise or talent-wise, they're no better than us at all. In this first game of the playoffs, the bootleggers jump out to an early lead, as has become their trademark. Former University of Toronto quarterback Rod Moores hits ex-Ottawa Sooners star Jamie Straw for the game's first touchdown. Straw wasn't good enough to make the Ottawa Rough Riders in his tryout with them. Like so many Canadian football stars, his career was over before his prime. But Straw has found a home as the fan favorite with the bootleggers. Uh, I'm really more of a friend of the crowd, like the semi-pro team, the bootleggers. People that come out to, to watch our games are friends, you know, friends of myself, friends of friends that are friends of mine. Um, as far as be playing professional, um, I think it's probably pretty easy to get lost in the turmoil of it all. And, you know, who knows Jamie Straw, you know, when he's in the CFL. But here, they know me because I'm, I'm, I'm from the hometown and it's fine. A lot of the bootleggers have either played with or tried out for CFL teams, only to be turned away for one reason or another. The CFL requires each team to carry only a minimum number of Canadians on its roster. The rest of the lineups are filled by import Americans who are generally regarded as better trained athletes. They come from some of the top college football programs in America. Shane Ireland played with both the Ottawa Rough Riders and the Montreal Alouettes before finding a home with the bootleggers. Like most of the bootleggers, the hard-hitting linebacker grew up in Ottawa and played with some of the city's local amateur teams. And also, like most of the players, he is happy just to have a place to play competitive football in Canada. There's a lot of good football players around, and they finish playing junior ball or college or pro or whatnot, and they just pack it in. They either play touch football, and I know Ottawa has a big touch football program here, but um, there's a lot of room for you know contact football, and it seems that the guys want to play it. And I think at places like Montreal and Toronto, there's it's the same situation as Ottawa. There's a lot of uh, football players hanging around. For many of the bootleggers, the forming of the team was more of a reunion than a meeting. Ottawa is a strong grassroots football town. In the amateur ranks, the city boasts two university teams at Carleton and the University of Ottawa, a successful junior program with the Ottawa Sooners, 
35 high school teams in the area, and 20 other minor teams. Tight end Gord Hudson says the fact that many of the team's players had been together before contributes to the overall success of the team. Everybody knows everybody on this team, and some people have had a shot, some people are lucky enough to pay in the pros. But right now that doesn't matter anymore. You know, we're just here and we all get along. We all have a good time off the field as well as on the field. So I think that's all in all is what goes on in this team. The team was born in Ottawa in 1988 when the Ottawa Rough Riders were at their lowest both on and off the field. The Riders hadn't had a winning season in years and the fans were getting fed up. Rider administration didn't know what to think of the bootleggers at the time and seemed to view the team as a threat, a view present-day general manager Joanne Pollock chooses to oppose. Um, and what happened is the administration overreacted and just sort of sat back and started to act as though, oh, well, my goodness, we're afraid of this and, and you know, let's ignore the bootleggers and almost don't say the B word. And that's just childish, you know. I mean, it, we're a professional sport and we're supposed to be able to stand up to anything that's thrown at us. Yeah. White said that the bootleggers tried to put the fun back into football. In order to go to any, any kind of event, whether it's uh, arts or sports or, you know, movie, whatever, um, it has to be fun. And I think football wasn't fun for a while. You know, it was just either too serious, too life and death. Uh, whether the, the teams themselves were taking themselves too seriously or the fans were, you know, hey, I've, I've just paid $18 and did I have fun? No. So uh, we just tried to um, put the fun back into it where, you know, it was sort of something to go to the game. Polek admits that the riders were beaten to the punch a few times before her arrival on the scene in the winter of 1988-89. The bootleggers have become known for such promotional ideas as renaming Lansdowne Park Death Valley Stadium and having specialty games such as Elvis Night or Unpaid Parking Ticket Night. 73-year-old Pearl Fleming was a runner-up in the 1988 Miss Grey Cup contest, but this year the bootleggers crowned her Queen of Football and Miss Ottawa Bootlegger. Each game, she leads the crowd in song for the third quarter stretch. Oh, I think they're a great team. I think they're, uh, they play blood and guts. Real football, that's what I like. <laughs> Polak is not too proud to admit that the riders have actually followed the bootleggers in terms of marketing. I mean, there, I remember when we, I sat at the Grey Cup game in 88, and I'll never forget this. And I was sitting there, and actually, because they had offered me this job the night before that game, so my mind was in a mess. And I'm sitting there, and I'm really disappointed that the Rough Riders aren't selling any season tickets during the Grey Cup. And uh, sure, sure enough, down comes a pamphlet passed down through the stands, and there it is, buy bootlegger season tickets. And I thought, these guys aren't missing any opportunities. A lot of the strategy that we took last year as far as our, our marketing campaign, really we took a page out of the, out of the bootleggers book. Um, the bootleggers marketing was fun and it was imaginative and creative and it didn't follow any one set plan. On the field, the bootleggers are pulling away from the Shamrocks in what was a tight game through three quarters. White has prided himself on his team's rough style of play that never lets up. White argues that the American style of football is more attractive to fans because the smaller field means a tougher, rougher game. The American rules, um, I think it's a little more pure, uh, you know, there's less motion, things are a little more, it's more like a chess game, it's less like a, um, you know, a jacks game, you know, everything's always constant motion, so when the CFL is on, when there's a good game, when it's on, it's very exciting, but I think overall, I think you'll see a more um, uh, hard-hitting, uh, hard-nosed style game in the American game than you will in the Canadian game.
With the Shamrocks disposed of, the Ottawa bootleggers start to concentrate on their next enemy, the Brooklyn Mariners, all the way from New York City. But the victory for the bootleggers also means five more nights of practice and five more nights that the players won't get home until 10 in the evening. Anyone driving by the Terry Fox Center on this night might mistake the bootleggers for a bunch of kids who don't know it's past their bedtime. But this ragtag group is deadly serious about a national championship, serious enough to practice after their day jobs until 9 p.m. on an ice-covered field before heading inside to view game films of the Brooklyn team. The temperature on this night is about as low as the profile of most of these players' careers. Only a lonely dog is interested enough to see what the bootleggers are up to. As a veteran of the Canadian Football League's glory days, general manager Alex Saunders understands their spirit. Underneath, I'd like, I'd like to call it a kind of patriotism, and people don't like to talk about that too much these days, but I will. And uh, I think there's a good, solid uh, ingredient of patriotism behind what these guys are doing. They love it, they love the, the game, and they just love what they're doing. Unlike many other recreational sports, football is a rough game. The bootleggers, unlike pro athletes, have to work other jobs not just in the off-season, but during the season. Linebacker Paul Brown is a special education teacher at St. Mark's School in Manatick, and also a separate school trustee. The graduate of Simon Fraser University, who couldn't make the CFL, says playing football doesn't bother his professional career. It's, it's great having, being able to, uh, you know, to have the, again, you know, to, ha to have your profession, whatever it may be, and, and also have the, the, uh, the whole, F, you know, stay involved in athletics and, uh, and uh, staying active. And does Brown's intimidating presence on the football field get carried with him into the classroom? I guess when you think of when one thinks of a linebacker, they, they think of um, think of someone who's who's always got a per perpetual frown on or, or, or snarl on, I should say. And uh, and uh, I, I don't think that's the way I, I, I come across. But uh, again, people are um, are surprised because again, once once the, the helmets go on, then then you have to put put on a different kind of face. And uh, as a co-founder of the team, former general manager Jeff Morris was not surprised at the numbers of Ottawa area players willing to commit to a five-month season. Uh, I'm not surprised because if you love the game, you love the game. I mean, I, I played for three years and I didn't get anything out of it other than just the fun and satisfaction of it. And uh, some guys are looking for another shot. And, and uh, you know, if if you don't like the way it is and you don't want to play, then hey, there's three other guys waiting to fill your spot. So. That another icy day at Lansdowne. The bootleggers battle with adversity never seems to end. A hearty crowd turns out to cheer the boots towards a berth in what is being called the National Title Bowl game the following week. If the bootleggers win, the game will be held at Lansdowne Park. Brooklyn seems to have trouble coping with the icy conditions that Canada has greeted them with. One of the biggest attractions of the bootleggers has been their bridging of the gap between the fans and players. Unlike so many of the sports heroes of today, all of the bootleggers live locally and are approachable to most fans. A lot of local players, ex-Sooners, ex-Carlton, ex, ex, ex U, you can identify with them. The team feels it can better identify with the fans because of their Ottawa flavor, even if they aren't always the best of role models. The appeal of the bootleggers again fills a void left by the CFL. Fans like this one have had trouble identifying with the CFL's players who change from game to game. I've been a season ticket holder for the Riders now for 15 years. I don't know, I don't know half the players on the team. I used to know all the players, plus all the players on the other teams. It's a little difficult. There are too many changes. White agrees that the bootleggers have put consistency back into the player roster and have helped fans grow to support their own. People. I think, and we, th you know, I think the organization as a whole believes that people want to go out and watch their own play against someone else's own. They don't want to see uh, 
someone from East West uh, Missouri State come up here for four months out of the year and then be gone or for four games out of the year and be gone so um, I think people want to see continuity but Polak disagrees while she agrees there is an important element in players living in Ottawa and staying around long enough to identify with fans she belittles the Canadian content argument we've got a young fellow on our team now named Tyrone Thurman and I mean the kids love him. They love him, you know, he's Pee Wee Thurman. They love him because he's five foot two, 135 pounds, and can grab a punt, you know, and he returns a punt, 91 yards for a touchdown, right through the legs of these big guys. The kids love him, the fans love him, they chant Pee Wee, Pee Wee, and they don't care of the fact that he's from Texas and not from here. And we also have a young fellow who's here now, Ken of Rare. He's, he grew up here in Ottawa, and he's from Ottawa, and no matter how much we tell people, people don't know that. Back on the field, the bootleggers are socking it to the mayor. It is the team's 13th consecutive victory of the season. Brooklyn player Connell Johnson, a graduate of an American University program, was impressed and surprised by the bootleggers' brand of football. Uh, I was sort of surprised. I thought it was one of those wild, free shootout type games. But they played just like us, and um, I was I was impressed with the way the, the bootleggers played. And uh, I want to wish them the best of luck. And yeah, they, I, like I said, there's no difference. You know, they play just like how we play in America: rough, tough, hard, aggressive, and nothing fancy. If there has been any one criticism of the bootleggers, it is that too many of their games have been blowouts by halftime, with the bootleggers winning in a romp. White explains that as an independent team, the bootleggers can schedule their own games and try to bring the best opponents into Lansdowne. But he also gives credit to his team. Also, I think a lot of teams uh, aren't ready for us when they come here because there's a there's juggernaut of real <laughs> serious people on the football field when the whistle goes. and. Uh, and people aren't ready when they come here to play us. They get shocked. In the first quarter, or the beginning of the second quarter, we usually just blow people out of the game. And then they sit there in shock, and we just, we don't let up. We keep going and going and going. But are the bootleggers an Ottawa phenomena or the beginning of a trend? Bootlegger co-founder Jeff Morris is now one of nine members on the board of directors for the Montreal Voyageurs, who will enter next season a semi-pro team in the Empire Football League. Well, there is a, there is a team being put into Montreal right now called the Montreal Voyageurs and uh, the there has been talk of, of putting a team in uh, in the Windsor area of team the talk of team putting a Toronto area there have been uh, some interest in Vancouver there's been some interest in Halifax uh, every one of those cities is is an ideal location I don't know about the East Coast because the proximity to other US teams isn't that good but uh, you know, again, it's it's a needed thing. There's Polak is skeptical about the possibility of semi-pro success across the country. I mean, so winning and losing has more to do with sports than anything else. And I think the fact that the bootleggers have been so successful and have won so many games is a real drawing card to the fans. But if you get a semi-pro team in Saskatoon or in Calgary and they go, you know, they have the same win-loss record that the Rough Riders did, you wouldn't see the same kind of success that you do here. Before the final game, the Mariners file a protest that the bootleggers wore illegal spikes in their shoes to help their traction and even watered the field before the game to hurt Brooklyn's chances. By Thursday before the title bowl game, the commissioner rules in favor of Ottawa and the game will take place at Lansdowne against the Racine Wisconsin Raiders, the defending national champions. The weather for the December 6th final is the harshest of the season. A bone-chilling minus 17 degrees Celsius registers on the scoreboard clock at Lansdowne. The game was held up trying to get the 8,000 fans into the park. In a throwback to an era gone by, the Raiders won't leave their locker rooms until they have the money for their travel expenses given to them by the bootleggers. The conditions for this game are as bad as any football player has ever had to play in. teams have trouble competing against the elements.
The Raiders go ahead in the fourth quarter on a pass by quarterback Charlie Bliss, and the boots are down to their last chance. With the elements in the clock going against them, the bootleggers need a miracle to engineer a successful final drive. Six months of practice has come down to a one-minute battle with Mother Nature for bootlegger quarterback Rod Moores and his teammates. last desperate attempt dies and Racine are national champions. And nationalism was not a forgotten issue in this battle. What does this mean for next year and how tough will it be for the bootleggers to get up for another season like this one? I talked to Tim McGowan one day, uh, I said, Tim, you coming back next year? And at first he wasn't going to come back. And then he said, yeah, I'm going to come back because we lost the championship. And then uh, two seconds later he said, you know what, Straw? I said, what? He goes, if we had won the champ national championship, he would have come back next year to defend it. You know, you know all, all of us are doing it for the love of the game. And you won't get rid of any of us until we physically cannot play it anymore. Their second season completed, the bootleggers plan to professionalize the team's front office and polish their off-the-field image. The team has grown faster than either White or Morris originally expected, and at times the confusion of running a football team was too much for just two men. But it's, it started out as a hobby and it grew into too much of that, and now the team has a board of directors in place and everything, and that's what it needs. It's, it's too big for, for a couple of guys to do as a, as a hobby. It's, it's just too much. New head coach Greg Marshall will replace Mike White, who moves to team president. Well, Mike and I have uh, different personalities, obviously, but uh, I'm not going to try to take away from what the bootleggers have established the last two years, and that's, you know, be rough and tough and uh, be ready to play when it's time to play, and uh, when it's not time to play, they have a good time, and that's what we want to continue this year. But can the bootleggers change the team without losing the simple character that the fans have grown to love? General Manager Alex Saunders insists that what the fans see on the field will not change. And this is a player's team, and, and that's been a theme throughout the whole restructure. Behind the green doors, the boardroom, it's real serious business, uh, but we'll, we'll get fun out of doing it the right way. But out on the field, no, same guys, doing the same thing, their style, it's a player's game, and that's the way we want to keep it. Next season will prove whether the extended bureaucracy of the silver and black affects the simplicity of the bootlegger's character a type of character that is all too rare in sport today. Most pro athletes dream of playing in their hometowns. It never comes true for most, but Jed Tommy became an exception today. He signed with the Ottawa Rough Riders after they worked out a deal with Hamilton for future considerations. We, co we couldn't give him his, his Hamilton number. We couldn't give him uh, the number uh, that his grandfather has, so we managed to come up with the next best thing, and that's number 23, which he has worn in high school. University. And university. Yeah. Jed. Thank you, Thanks, Tommy retired following last November's loss to Saskatchewan in the Grey Cup final to take a job as marketing director of Scott Canada here in Ottawa. The deal with Hamilton gave him the best of both worlds. I'm very happy. I'm, it's something that uh, since I was playing minor football here in Ottawa, I'd, I'd wanted to do. And uh, I think it's great that, that, you know, you play football for a while, you decide to get out of it, uh, you go back to your hometown, it ends up that the, you know people work things out and you're able to play. I mean, it's something that you can't foresee. It's so good. It's, it's really what you want to happen, and, and it all happened. It was great. Earlier today, Ottawa's other football team, and by far the most successful last year, announced plans for the coming season. The Boots were a big hit on the field and at the box office. They won 12 of 13 games. 
drew upwards of 7,000 fans some nights. A good time was had by all. However, they have evolved to the point where they have a $200,000 budget. It's now a business, and they must handle it as such. There's money changing hands, and uh, that's, that's considered pretty serious stuff for some people. But that, that means behind, behind the, the boardroom doors. We, we, we're serious, yeah. But once we step out on stage, and the curtain opens, and the band begins to play, and the whistles blow, it's going to be the same bootleggers. It's got to be. We owe it to the fans. Saunders plans to hand the GM duties to his assistant, John Mako, June 1st, but will remain involved. Former rider Greg Marshall replaces Mike White as head coach. The boots open the season at Lansdowne August 11th against the Brooklyn Kings, a team they beat in a last-second touchdown by Jamie Straw last year. Lansdowne Bank Street. The bootleggers are a ragtag group of graduate players from junior and college ranks who quickly became a hit since 1988 with local fans by playing American rule football against American teams. They lost the title game here last fall against Racine, Wisconsin. Today, outgoing general manager Alex Saunders outlined the new marketing strategy, plans for the season, and introduced a new head coach, former Rough Rider defensive star Greg Marshall, who is looking for some linemen. Uh, we're looking right now, recruiting-wise, trying to improve our depth at the uh, both line positions, and we're, we really could use some, some quarterback help. Really, right now, the only commitment we have quarterback-wise is Rod Morris, who played for us last year, obviously, but... Uh, you know, you, you got to have somebody backing them up just in case, and uh, I, hopefully we can uh, find, a, find somebody to give us a quality backup.